I feel like you're made. You were you were made for the TV. <laughs> just, oh dear. Just forget this. I am curious. I think you've told me this before. Like, how did you get into cooking? Because I know you're. How do I get into cooking? Because um, you're known for your glorious cooking and baking skills. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> That's you like to love it. When you love something, you can do it. It comes out good. Yeah. Put a lot of love in it, and I still do. How'd you start? Back in Paraguay? Oh, yeah. Started as a young kid. Had to. Really? Did they make, were you like making bread and stuff for the family? Oh, yeah. I made bread for the family. What else did you make? What else did I make? Bread. I made, uh, well, what we called Swebach. It was for Saturday. Every Saturday we would cook, um, you know, make something for Sunday. We didn't work on Sunday. We didn't cook on Sunday. Everything was done before, and yeah, and I love to cook. I love to cook from young on. I learned from mom, mom, yeah. and my stepmom taught me how to cook. What was the thing you cooked the most? What did I cook the most? What, everything with dinner, help with dinner, and bed with dinner, and yeah. bread a lot. Several times a week, I make bread. It was uh, seven of us. Seven children and mom and dad and grandma, grandpa. So it was 10 of us. And you made dinner for all of them? Well, I helped make the dinner. And at times I had to make the dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have the uh, all the easy stuff they have here. <laughs> Not very fresh vegetables. We didn't have too many of those. We grew some, but we didn't have really the good soil there. So, but yeah. It was pretty skimpy at first. Beans, beans and more beans. I don't want to see any more beans in my life. <laughs> but we had, uh, we didn't have a variety of food that they have here. But you know, you uh, buy a great big bag full of flour, 70 kilos at the time. And that would have stayed in the harbor for a while. And sometimes it was buggy. We just sifted it through the sifter and baked and ate it. As simple as that. That's all you had. That's all you had. But we most of the time did okay. Yeah, we did okay most of the time. What's Paraguay like? It used to be very poor. Now it's great. It used to be very poor, but now it's they're doing. This generation has been doing a lot better. The third, actually. Mom and dad started it. They got, came there as young adults or, or some are teenagers. They tra traveled. They came from Russia and with, the, with our grandmother. She came with 10 children alone. Grandpa had passed away at 45 and left her with 12 children. And uh, some of them were grown up. One stayed there, was married and stayed there with her husband. They were teachers. And one of the boys died at age 18. She, they had three boys and nine girls, twin boys, and then a, a boy alone, Henry. He died at, I don't know what he died from. But then when my grandfather got to be 45, he died. And grandma was left alone all that time with the rest of the kids. And uh, she came with 10 of them. She fled Russia when the communists took over and got too rough. They fled the country. And they tried to find... Uh, place where they could, uh, they wanted to come into Canada. A lot of people from there, different groups came into Canada and they were in a group that came in, but they had closed the doors. The gates were closed because, you know, they had their fill for the time being. And uh, so you couldn't go through the border and they waited and see who else would open the doors. And Paraguay really wanted them and Bolivia wanted them, the awful poor countries though. And uh, so they signed up for, well, Paraguay and, and I think Bolivia, they were had a war. They fought over them. They, uh, Paraguay won. And the day um, after they closed, had after they had closed Canada, the day, the day before they left, they opened up, but they wouldn't take them in, and they had to go to Paraguay. And that was too bad because it would have been one of my aunts got in and uh, I think oh, she was in a different group. There was different groups going, you know, so at one time and my 
my father and grandfather, uh, they were from, I think they were from Siberia, and my mother was from Moscow, mother's side. Mother's side was well-to-do. They had a lot of money. They had a couple of big estates. Grandpa had, uh, he was a farmer. He had, uh, uh, the, he got, uh, I think, the uh, good cattle from uh, either from Holland or somewhere in there. He would get his, his uh, so he had all these people. They didn't have machinery to work the land, but they had uh, big horse, work horses, and of course they had camels and all that stuff, sheep. They had a herder, uh, a family that uh, would take care of the sheep. And uh, they had a, a tutor that came to the house to taught the kids. They had uh, all what they wanted, but uh, they had to work. Though. All the kids had to work. Grandpa was very strict. They had to really work. So, but anyway, that's, they flattered my grandfather and my father if, uh, got over the frozen river. They fled into China. They were there for two years and with a group. They had a group, small group that they were shooting after them, but they once they got past the border, they couldn't get them back. So they just fled what they had on. And, you know, over the frozen river. And they stayed there for two years. My father was 16, I think he told me, when they went over there. And then they all, uh, group by group, they ended up in, in Paraguay. And uh, that's where he met my mom. And uh, some of my aunts went to Argentina. They had all worked in the big city. The, the girls all went to the big city and worked, which is Asuncion. It wasn't that easy to get to it then, but my uh, mom, they all worked in the hospitals there and everywhere. They were just all around working. And uh, three of my aunts ended up traveling to Argentina. I got married and moved to Argentina. And my youngest aunt and the second youngest aunt and uh, the twin brothers um, came with mom to, uh, they stayed there and they, um, my youngest aunt came to Philadelphia, and the other one stayed in us. Some stayed in East Paraguay. East Paraguay was a little better climate. It was like tropical there, and the art was all jungle and dry cactus and uh, rattlesnakes and all that stuff, just uh, wild. And at first, they had nothing. They had they bought land. Paraguay sold them land because that nobody wanted in the upper place of Paraguay. And uh, they would put down tarps on the ground and uh, just all asleep there. And then in the morning, they rolled them up and got busy doing something. And they found the rattlesnakes under there. They never got bit or anything, but they got under the tarp somehow. And uh, so that's how they, and it was so dry that it didn't rain much. And uh, so that, uh, you know, so they, uh, that was rough going, very rough going at the time. Yeah. Hey, were you born yet? Mm -mm. No, I wasn't there yet. Not hey, even, that's so. this kind that's, of colony they started. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the some of them started. Uh, well, they had uh, there was that big piece of land had open spots where they the, where the grass would grow. The the bittersweet grass, tall grass would grow. Some of them would dig holes, square holes, and buy uh, uh cut you know small trees and lay them across on one end and take that tall grass and lay it over it, it would be their bed. And the other ones, the other places, okay, and then they would make like roofs just like that. And they put that, uh, they made uh, some kind of dirt and clay together and they, they, that sh that um, grass, that bittersweet grass, and they would start, they started on the bottom on the roof and they would make the roof on it. It was so thick that it wouldn't rain through that. And it rained and poured there, but never never got wet because it was so thick right to the top. And I don't know what they just did on the top. They did with clay and stuff, and it did stay pretty good. And that was maybe two steps down. They would cut it, you know, cut it like that. They make holes in the ground and uh, a trench, maybe a hole in the ground, and then they make a hole this way up there, and you put your little cattle up there and little black cattle, and you cook some of your meals off that. 
very simple. It was very simple. Now, was this your dad that was kind of designing all this? Because he was an inventor, right? They, uh, they were, him and mom had gotten married by that time. I guess they were making their own bricks. They had a little, made a little form that would make bricks. And they, and they would tip them, you know, tip them out and then uh, let them dry. And uh, later on, well, they, their house, they built a little house with a basement. I never saw a basement there. I don't even know where that was. And uh, later on in the year, they bought that same <laughs> place, but that was already uh, broken down and the other one built up. But they had, uh, Mom, we were four little kids, and Mom, Dad went out with Dad in the woods, and they used this great big uh, pull saw because they would cut trees down and, uh, and do some of the, didn't have any sawmill or anything, so they used them as, I don't know how thick they were, as corner posts for the house four of those, you know, it's just like that. And they would, the raw bricks, bricks they would lay up. As long as there was no rain, then would be all right. <laughs> and sometimes they would even wash away a little bit. So, but it was rough going for them. I don't know all the details, but still, we were, finally, we were four little kids. Mom was sick. She got really sick. And her grandfather was in there somehow. I don't know how, what happened there. There's a lot of things when we were younger. We, I didn't really know a lot. I just know uh, she was really sick. And she asked, because our grandmother couldn't come. She was too far away. And the, the means of getting to us was very hard. So, no, we just, um, you know, and uh, mom was went to the hospital. and She had a nervous breakdown. She really worked very hard. And she had a younger sister there, my aunt that was helping a lot. They had no children. They were helping with us kids. And we were with them a lot. And Your dad was an inventor. What was that like? Like, was he just constantly making stuff? Oh, no, he he learned. I don't know where he learned to be a mechanic. I don't know where he learned, but he's he's taught many young men to, to do the mechanics, to work the lathe, to work the, um, he would invent things something was broken you couldn't buy parts and he just look at look at it and make it find some um, material to make it with like a, a hammer on a gun or something he would make something like that took a while to make things you know but he went did pretty good inventing things he made a windmill Is that he right? did made a little windmill yeah and uh so and that's was uncle paul and him had a picture standing by it and he says he couldn't want to learn English. He looked at himself and he pointed, little man and big man, he said to Paul. He was, Paul, Uncle Paul was so big. And he stood, you know, so, but, and, uh, no, he, my father did invent a lot. He did, uh, he made a, uh, lathe, a machine that would, uh, what do you call it? Um, they have gas, them with gas and they have electric ones. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, I can't even think of the word, the word. Or you have something broken and you want to, you got to have it fixed. You use um, all the grate in your front of your car. Oh, the, the grill? The grill was kind of bad. Yeah. And one time they came through town and uh, looked for my father and my brother. And they whisked him away in a Jeep and took him out to the woods. They didn't know what's going on. Well, they told him to bring their machine or something. They learned Spanish a little bit. They took him in there and they didn't know what in the world they was doing with them and took off with them, you know, the soldiers. Well, the president came through and something happened with that. that the bro president? Yeah. Of Paraguay? Mm -hmm. He came through and they, they got my brother and my father to fix the, uh, what do you call it? The, like the motorcade? So that would, would be with the lathe when something breaks that you... Uh, um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but he fixed the president's car. Oh yeah, they fixed the, yeah, they fixed the thing. I think it was a jeep or something. They fixed it anyway, and uh, <laughs> I had to laugh. Uh, my brother and my father went. To, my father was teaching my brother a, a lot from just little kid on. He really was right into all this, mm -hmm. and uh, so my brother really is has made uh, a number of. Uh, freezers, uh, ice freezers that he does, ice machines. He's got all kinds of them, all stainless steel. He's, he came here and looked at one time, looked at the uh, 
Gatchel was a big place where they made ice and stuff. Yeah. And he said, can, so my, uh, and, uh, my husband said, can, can we look at that? There's nothing they're going to, there's no com competition. He just wants to know how to, how they're made or something. Oh, sure. Help yourself. Come look. And he looked it over and went home and made it. And made, you know, instead of buying, we couldn't always buy things there. And it took a little longer, but he wouldn't make things. And uh, so we had a bunch of machines that, that made all sizes of, uh, of ice that they sold all the time. Big bars, small bars, different shapes. And Don he invented, he made something that would bag it up and tie it and everything. Really? That's yeah. Cool. He's selling all that. And he has three little scooters. I never seen them here. But they're little cars, just a one-person car. And then they have a big box in the back, and they have them full of ice bags. And he would, they do it to this day. They go and take it to different places, different areas where they need ice. Wow. Makes a lot of ice. Yeah, so on. But anyway, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. When did you come to the United States for the first time? In 1960. What was that like? What was that, your reaction to the United was, States? Uh, well, strange. Yeah? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I didn't know the language, for one thing. I didn't know anything. I suggested no one that's about it. Oh, so what'd you do? Uh, I said, Hi. Well, the family I came with, I came with uh, a family that was uh, the ambassador to the United States in Asuncion. And uh, one of the, I don't know if he was ambassador, but he worked for the, in the embassy for the, for the people uh, of the United States in Asuncion. They still have people there now from America all the time. And uh, they had two little children and I was their uh, governess and for the children and they wanted to take me along. My dad and mom were there and they invited them for supper. And my father spoke pretty good Spanish by that time. And this family spoke Spanish. He was uh, from Spain originally, Mr. Fernandez. And they spoke Spanish in their home. The kids didn't know English. They had two little ones. Of course, they just started to four, four years old and 18 months. Four, she was five, the old turned five and the other one was about two. And so, yeah, I was taking care of them. They said, would you like to come with us? We don't know if they're going to send us back here or not. And, and I said, but if you come with us and stay at least a year, maybe, if they're there. And uh, I said, sure, why not? I'll stay a year. So well, I, they asked my mom and dad if it was okay first. You know, I was 21. And I mean, I've been with them for a year, over a year. So they got papers going before they had to go home. And they went on vacation back to, because he'd been sent from different places. He would went to Spain another time for a few years. And so after we were here about five months, he sent them back to Paraguay because he's Spanish. He did good. And then, you know, no, they said, you want to stay here? Or do you want to come back? We'll take you back. You like to. But if you want to stay, this is your opportunity to stay because they made papers for me. I said, and I had three cousins here in Connecticut I'd never seen before, and I got to know them. I don't know where we got the address, but I had their address and their phone number, and I got to know them, and they begged me, oh, stay, stay, stay. I said, I'll stay a year, and then I'll go home. And uh, for so here I am. After, this came here in 1960, September 14th, and I've been here now, what, 60? This is my 63rd year. So, been home a few times. The first time I went home was after 12 years. But they went back, and I was here, they were here about five months. And they sent them back, and I went with my aunt and uncle. And he found me some employment. And it was a little rough going because I didn't know the language. So I had to really started to learn a little bit. The five months we were here, I learned a little bit because they spoke more and more English to the children and everything. And I was, I went through the White House when uh, President Eisenhower was about to leave. I went through in September, of course. I went through the White House. It was very interesting. Of course, I didn't understand anything, but he took me with his, his the two little kids went. I don't know if the wife went, but he had three grown children here. And two of them, I think, went with us too. So it was interesting. And I was just a walking distance from the White House anyway. We lived right around there in a hotel. 
And so I took the children to the park and we would be feeding the pigeons and the, and the squirrels and the kids would just be cheering. The little boy was in a stroller, of course, and he had, uh, he was paralyzed, you know, so he wasn't able to walk on his own and beautiful children, just beautiful children. Wasn't there a story you're telling me, like you were trying to find a church and you couldn't oh, really speak the goodness. language? But... Yeah. Not then. I had to wait until... When I left then, went to Connecticut, and I got to, well, I worked in three different places. And then I got in in uh, Connecticut, uh, went to, uh, wait a minute, New Haven, Connecticut. I lived for a while with the with the lady, and I was I could um, I tried to go to church, and I stop. I get off the bus, and, and uh, just got off the bus and. Listen, there was churches everywhere around. And I go in, start to go in, and I listen to hear a song that I might know nothing. And they didn't, I didn't understand the music. I couldn't hear it. I didn't uh, recognize anything. So I didn't go in, of course. I went in a little bit, and I said, nope, that's not it. I went out to another one, and then one time I got off the bus, and I heard uh, a music coming from somewhere outside. It was an accordion. Uh, what was the song? It was the Old Rugged Cross. Old Rugged Cross. And I said, oh, that's a song I know. I got off and I followed the music. And there was a group in the park uh, singing and uh, playing the accordion. And they had it sort of roped off a little bit. And I went over there and stood and listened and smiled, you know. And they, they welcomed me on and and then were very friendly to me, and I, I just enjoyed it so much. And I found out they were the, uh, uh, let me see, Salvation Army. Oh, yeah. yeah, they took me to their church. Of course, later around the buses don't go. And they took me to, uh, so I went with them. They had a little prayer meeting in a little time. I enjoyed it. They took me home by car and were very friendly to me, you know, were very nice and so forth. And the lady that I worked for found out and she said, I'm not gonna have you go there. The next thing you're gonna do is stand in the corner and ring the bell with a little kettle to beg for money and I'll take you to a church. So she took me to a congregational church down the street from her place and she went to church with me and the next Sunday I went by myself Never was there a person that said hi to me, nothing. Nobody spoke to me, no. And I said, well, this is not for me. Yeah. And uh, then I found out there was a couple of ladies that were working for her. One was a cleaning lady twice a week, and the other one was a cook. And I went to, uh, and I was supposed to be, I don't know, her, her helper or something in between, you know, so so she wouldn't be alone or something and do, do some of the work in between. So, and uh, one of them went to, uh, let me see, a Lutheran church. So I went to a Lutheran church. I visited, I, I'll go to visit with you to Lutheran church. I did go, but that wasn't it either. So I didn't. It took me a long time. And I went in there and I didn't, um, that really wasn't, didn't feel good. So, how'd you know when you found the right, right church? Oh, I found the right one after a few years. Oh yeah. Took a little bit. It was Which actually. Yeah. Um, I went to um, then when we got, I went to another Lutheran church that was in German first, and then I could hear. I had to go real early by bus, and I found it, and that was in German, but it also was very uh, cold like, but still I could understand some of that and. So my aunt gave me a, a Bible that was German and English. And I had that for a long time. I don't know what I did with it. But anyway, that wasn't the one either, though. And I went, to, for a while, I went to another church. It was a congregational church. And it was different. I said, well, I guess they're different here. That's all. I have to accept it, you know, but didn't feel home. And then... Uh, uh, I I'm, I'm, got this job working for this family. They had five children, number six on the way, and I was supposed to be their helper for four months 
before she had the baby and four months after the baby came or something like that or two months maybe after them. So I was with them for a while and uh, I went with them to the Catholic Church even. I said, well, where, where am I going to go? And and then they opened a little chapel right in the corner from our block was a little chapel that opened every summer. So I said, that's easy. Jump out of bed, take a quick shower, get dressed and go to church right there. So I did. I went there for quite a while. And that was okay. That was not bad. I met Grandpa. and You met him there? No, no, I didn't meet him there. I met him through a friend. I went to... Um, that she worked in a drugstore where her mother worked. And uh, she was pretty friendly. And so I got friendly with her. And then I had a little place I was waiting for. I don't know what it was now. I was... Uh, um, I had, I had taken car lessons from a family that I had lived with. I took car lessons in the meantime, and, but I didn't drive. And I got my license after a while, but I didn't drive anyway. But when I came to this family with the five children, and she said, take the station wagon and go while you want to see me drive. It was terrible. I backed that big thing up. It was a great big car, old car. I backed that up out of the yard and I took off with it and I didn't go too far and just found a place where I could turn around easy around town just to get my feeling a little bit. Little by little, I kept driving it and they let me use it for the weekend. They gave me a weekend off. Although they said, can we trade? Can we have either Saturday or Sunday? I said, sure, I'll give you Saturday. I like to go to my aunt's on Sunday. So they let me, they, t they went on Saturday, they would go off and do things and I stay with the children and stuff. So they were awful nice. What a nice family. And one time I didn't make it, so I went to church with them. And they said, you can pray here too, you know? And I said, yeah, I can, I know. So they were really nice because uh, they said, you're going to sit with us at the table? And I said, am I allowed to? And they said, of course you're allowed to. What do you mean oh, you're allowed to? You're here, you're here with the family. And your family, part of the family, I don't blame you if you don't want to sit with all these kids. I said, oh, no, that's not it. And he said, well, we say the prayer, and I know you probably do yours. Yes, I said, I do. That's okay. You go ahead and have your prayer. And, and he would get stand right up and say the prayer at the table every day. Every He'd stand day. up? Yeah. And he would have the prayer every time. When he went to bed, I was upstairs on the third floor. I had a bedroom up there. And of course, I had to walk through the through the hallway, and the father was kneeling by the bed by each child and had prayer with them. They were really a nice family. They really was a very good family. I loved that family. I got to really love them. I was there over a year with them. It was so good because they were going to let me go after a while, and she was going to get a new bathroom. And he said, do you want the bathroom, or do you want to keep Susie? She said, I'll keep Susie. <laughs> no bathroom can wait, she said. So I had a good time with her. We just We were near the ocean. I took the kids to the ocean all the time. They went swimming in there. We had a good time. I even took the baby out there. Wow. Took the baby in a walk in a carriage and took him downstairs. And I got a big umbrella and set that up. And I sat under the umbrella on a blanket with the little one. And the other kids were playing around me near the water. It was fun. It was really fun. I had a good time with that family. What was the church that you knew was for you? Well, when we got married, when I met dad, grandpa, yeah, and uh, that was on a blind date, this girl that worked in the in the drugstore, she said, I'll introduce you to somebody. Uh, I had dated somebody, but that wasn't the right thing, and I knew it wasn't the right thing. And even though I thought I was in love, it, it, I'm glad that it didn't work out because I knew my parents uh, wasn't the same faith and it, they would not be happy, and I said, I can't let it, uh, let myself go too close to him. So he went away to college in any way, and she says, I'll, she, know, she knew him, and she said, I will meet. want you to meet somebody that I know that's really nice. There's five guys from Maine. They live together. She goes, she was dating one of them, and it was, they had a big fence over there, and she said, um, she would talk over the fence quite often to them, and they would spend time there. And she had one of the guys she met, Jerome, it was her uh, husband. And anyway, so uh, he, he 
She said, I'll have you meet somebody. So I met her at the drugstore, came over there and met him at the drugstore. And he went to the corner to have a bite to eat, a hamburger. Yeah. And so I wouldn't, uh, my friend said, oh boy, get the biggest thing. I said, are you kidding? I would never do that to anybody. I don't want to, first of all, I'm, I lost weight and I'm going to keep it off. And I don't want to, if I get a little burger, that'd be fine. And so I just had a burger. And what was that first date like? That was the, strange. Strange. <laughs> well, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know him. <laughs> and and uh, so, uh, and then. Uh, what was your first impression? I don't know. I just said, you know, well, I'll meet him. But I said, I don't. I wasn't uh, interested in getting serious with anybody. I just wasn't. Because a lot of them, I don't want to say too much, but anyway, uh, I thought it'd be better not. They were too, uh, too forward, too brazen. Didn't like it, and the coming on a little bit too strong. And she said, "I'll guarantee you this one is not like that." And I said, "All right, I'll date him. Then. I'll I'll walk, go out with him. Then. At least I was going to meet him." And uh, it was a good thing because he helped me get off the, from away from the other one. And, and he called me for a date. I wasn't ready to go back out right off. And uh, I don't know if he met, met the 20th. I don't know if I met him one more time before he went to, yeah, I guess we did. And I said to her, why don't you come with him? We go double date. And so she did. She came with him because he couldn't find a place exactly where we lived anyway. So he came with her. It was really strange. And uh, so I said, I really don't want to go by myself. <laughs> I was kind of shy at the time. But anyway, it's, it's, then he went to, to see his parents for Christmas and stuff. We didn't see each other, you know, for a little bit. When he came back, he called again, wanted me to, I said, that was Sunday morning. I said, don't you go to church? I thought, Ooh. you know, I shocked myself and my, the lady that says, Good for you, she goes. Uh, I used to go all the time, but uh, can I take you and and uh, and I'll just drop you off and, and next Sunday I'll go with you. And gran Grandpa said that uh -huh. to you? Yeah. Wow. And I said, okay. I said, I go to church on Sundays. And so and then, then after that, I was so embarrassed. I was glad he couldn't see my face or anything. I was red as a beat. She got the biggest kick out of that. She said, good for you, girl. <laughs> she said, so. And then he came, when he came back for a date, that was funny. She opened the door and and it was getting cold. It was still cold winter. And they had a porch there. I loved their house. It was um, partly stone, partly. But it was a beautiful house, brown house. But it was, I always loved that house. They had piled wood there and they had a fireplace. She says, would you mind bringing a few pieces of wood in? She said to him the first time she met her, no, nope. he said, not at all. He's just as friendly. He came and bought wood in. And she said after me, oh my goodness, what did I do that for? She says, that's it. I know this is it. I turned on red. I said, I don't know the guy. Don't say that. I was in the kitchen with her talking. <laughs> and the kids came around. Oh, the kids thought he was wonderful. He was friendly, you know, he loved kids. And, the kids found out that someday, well, not that Sunday, but, but another time he found out that he was uh, going to wanted to be a teacher eventually. And they were so excited when he came. Every time he came and the father would say, hey, kids, he didn't came to see you. He came to see Susie. <laughs> it was so funny. He had to go downstairs. The kids took him right down in the basement where they had a place to play and they started playing school with him. He had to play with them. I tell you, the kids loved him. They really just, really, that was really funny. It didn't take long. They were just around him all the time. When he came, he was so friendly with them. And they really liked him a lot. So, and she said the first thing she really met, uh, saw met him, she said, this is a really nice guy. She said, I know, this is it. I said, don't say that. I don't really know him. Yeah, but I can tell, she said, so. And really, she said, he's so nice. I don't know why I asked him to bring me wood in there. I needed it. She said, I just had him bring me some in. 
So it was kind of funny. Yeah, and then I had to work. Uh, they By that time, I already had found a couple other places to work part-time. They still had me for three days, and I had, no, I had, they had me for two days to work for them. And I had uh, uh, their friends there over there, and the family there, and the family there. Everybody wanted me at least for a day to do something. So one of them had me to do a little bit of housework. The other wanted me to do some ironing, and uh, the other one too. And then the one, finally, um, they decided they would see if I would stay with them uh, the rest of January and all of February. I guess it was it was pretty quick going there. I was, uh, yeah, I stayed there. Um, it was it February and March? Maybe it was February and March. Anyway. Um, I was there, and uh, and the lady that uh, that that family over there had uh, they had they were well off. They had money, and this family, but my he worked very hard. But they were not of the wealthy. They were uh, they were a very close family. They were Irish Catholic family, very nice family. And the other families were nice too, and, and uh, so anyway, that's uh, I'm trying to think of how that went. And she said, okay, would you stay with my daughter? She had a daughter and three sons. Would you stay with my daughter so I can have her in Florida for a month? Would you take care of the children? They had five children, small children, and one adopted. Oh, she was 14 or so. She was a little bossy, but anyway, they had adopted her son. And I said, yeah, I'll stay. So I stayed there with them. And the father would come home on and off. But he would be working mostly. He was an insurance salesman. And he'd go to Florida, too. And then after I was there a month, she called me back. She says, can I have her another month? I'd like to have her another month. And uh, so uh, anyway, um, I said, yeah, I'll stay. And she had bought me a ticket already to come to Florida. She wanted me to come to Florida and spend the rest of the, the winter months here with her. And by that time... Grandpa, I don't want you to go to Florida. And I said, what am I going to do? You know, she's expecting me to come, and she sent me the tickets already. And I don't know, but I really don't want you to go. And I was torn. I didn't know what to do. And he bought me the ring, and he gave me the diamond. And he says, get engaged. Well, I said, I said, don't worry. I'm not going to two time. I said, you know, if I'm going to stay with you, I would not go and date another guy. And he said, well, I really don't want you to go, he said. So And uh, so the lady that I worked for for a year, she said, you know what? You better tell them, no, you're not going to come to Florida because uh, he doesn't, doesn't want to have you go to Florida. And I had to tell her it was hard feelings between the lady, and I felt so bad. Oh, I felt so awful. She said, but you're going to spend your life with him. And you can't just be, and she wanted me to be a maid for her. I was supposed to be her cook eventually. She would come back and I would be her cook because I hadn't done some things that they really liked. And she said, she'd make a good cook for you. And she had a cleaning lady already and a family and a handyman. And they started there with her. They started with the little house, just a young couple. And they had three children already in their home. And they was, she, the lady, was doing her housework and stuff for her. And she had wanted me as her cook. And uh, so they had a pony farm and raising dogs and ponies. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't know what to, what to do, you know. And she had a beautiful little stone house that was all uh, ready, getting ready for me to move into. That's where she wanted me to be. And I told her, well, things have changed a little bit. I feel terrible about it, but I said, I kind of have to kind of go a little bit. He can't come with you. That's all right. They'll help him through school, you know. So how long have you two had been together then by the time he uh, gave you that ring? He got me the ring. It was the 8th of March. So how long was that? From 20th of from December to the 8th of March. So about three and a half months. Yeah. That's pretty quick. Then we got married. Well, I said, no, what am I going to do? I don't have a job now. I'm out of a job and things. And he said, let's get married. And I said, okay. He said, we're old enough to know what to do. And he said, we're both 
I'm 26, going on 27. You're 20, almost 24, one month away. And I said, okay. So we got <laughs> hurried up. <laughs> Just I hunted for a wedding dress, and I couldn't find anything. I didn't want to buy a new one. I couldn't afford it. I had no parents here to do the wedding for me. So and and uh, Grammy was so excited about it, and Grandpa too. He said almost wanted the girl, and they were so excited. They were really awfully good, and and uh, so we were going to have the wedding in Burlington. We decided because we didn't know. It was a lot of confusion. We didn't have really a place to go, and so we went to uh, to Burlington. And my aunt and uncle came down. My uncle gave me away, and his daughter. Two of his daughters were in, into the wedding, and Patty Page was the maid of honor. And uh, who was the best man? Oh, Uncle Ollie was the boss, best man. And uh, all the family made the food and bought the food together. And uh, and uh, Grammy said, uh, I called them Mr. and Mrs. I never called people by first name, especially. Uh, elderly people, or I would never. For, to this year, to this day, I haven't called some of them by first name. And I uh, just, uh, um, she said, "Well, I'll get the flowers." Okay, so she got two bouquet of flowers to put in the front. Can I do the cake? And I said, "That's okay by me. It's all right, Mrs. Turner, if you want to do that." And uh, so she ordered the cake, and uh, so. It was nice. It was simple, but it was nice. And April was cool. I didn't know that it was cool outside. So, but once we got out, we got to the wedding. The, the couple was really nice. They were really good Christians. The, the minister, oh yeah, and his wife, yeah. And she was playing. She played the piano, and I had got to know them just a little bit from a few days visit. And then it was but Carbolata, of course, and. Jeanette and Uncle Kenneth were saved. And uh, I think Great Grammy, I think, was saved too. She was really sweet, that lady. And uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, we had the wedding and I got out. We came out and it was, had, I guess it was a little snow still out there, ice and stuff. I borrowed the dress. My, my friends, uh, my uncles, uh, had met some people that they were friendly with. Their daughter had just got married a couple of months ago, before that. She was shorter and stockier than I was. She said, you can borrow my dress. I borrowed her dress, and some of the kids spent Kool -Aid, spilled Kool-Aid on it. I felt so bad about it. I was afraid it would stain it. And she said, all you need to do is have it dry clean for me, and that's all I asked for. So she was nice enough to let me borrow it. So it really was too big for me. It could take a whole handful and gather it in the back. And it's not one. Well, you can't see the feet, though. It's fairly good. So it's fairly good. So it was nice. It was very, very beautiful dress. And I got out to the door, and I asked Mrs. Turner, uh, do you mind if I uh, call Mr. Turner dad? Oh, she said he'd love it. I said, can I call you mom? She said, of course you can. You call me anything you want, but I love it, too. So from that time on, it was mom and dad. And uh, you know, and then Auntie and was all excited, and we, the guy got in with the family. I got really involved in the family and stuff. So, and that was that. And did you guys have a honeymoon? <laughs> one day on our way home to Connecticut, because I was working. He had to go back to work. So we had two days actually. We stayed in the Bangor house overnight. Those days they chased you still and tried to separate you and all the crazy stuff they did. They had. Uh, I guess uh, Uncle Ollie had taken Dad's car and hid it somewhere, Grandpa's car, and uh, and they they got to, me to the Bangor house. So we were they didn't know that we were there. We were there for a day, for overnight, and then they went on to Bahar. But the next day, and I had an awful headache for some reason. Crazy, it wasn't the most exciting <laughs> two days to get home to get to Connecticut, but that was okay. And we had rented a little. Tiny little cottage near the coast in West 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 Haven, I believe East Haven, maybe it was it was nice, and that's the way it got started. And here you are, sixty years later. Sixty years later, yeah. Off of a blind date, and then married four months later. Yeah, and I started hunting for church. I went to twenty six different churches. Oh yeah. 
before I found a church. We went, we moved to Danford, Connecticut, and we went, we went across the street. There was a little church across the street, and then I don't think it was a congregational Methodist church, maybe. But uh, I, the landlord that we had there, um, that was cold in Danford. Uh, their daughter, I met their daughter, and she she was across the street, across the river, in the same town, but across the river. They said, yeah, that's where all the uh, the good people live or something. I don't know, they make jokes and that. And they invited me one time, and I went with them to the church, and I said, that is it. I knew right off when I was in there, it was the right thing. What you, how'd you know? Like, it just, did it just feel right? You could feel right, you knew, you knew all the things. It, it was just so right, and it was Baptist church. I didn't know they were any different than anything else because I never been to one. I didn't know, and uh, but we didn't stay there just a few more months through school. And then we went to, we moved to, uh, came to Old Town. We moved to Old Town because we tried to find a house somewhere there and couldn't find one anywhere there. But we found an apartment in Old Town, and uh, the, you see, oh no, the landlord in Danford. We lived downstairs. It was a long, like a like train, one room after another, and um, upstairs. They lived upstairs, and uh, their daughter uh, invited us. She came. She said, "I'm in. We are an old time church. It's really nice there." She said, "When you, if you're going to move to Bangor or something, oh, I mean to Old Town or something, uh, come to this church with us." So we did. We went to the church with them. And it really was a nice church then, way back. Well, it was good anyway. So, and uh, it was good. That's when we started going to church. I counted 26 churches. But I went, went, and I was searching, I was searching, and I got away a little bit for a while. And you just, after a while, you just, you know, tried to fit in and yet not, never really comfortable. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have married if I had known. But anyway, it worked out fine. What, uh, what's been some of the tips you've learned over the 60 years of marriage? What's the, what are the keys to a successful marriage? Um, I didn't say much of anything for a long time. I was quiet. Um, you know, I just felt I would do whatever I need to do. So just, uh, we tried to, I was always, uh, Concerned, I didn't want to get into any arguments or anything, and we didn't have to anyway. I mean, there was no need for arguments as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we did, uh, you know, he did he did take care of all the financial things and all that stuff. My dad did that too. I was used to that from home. The man always took care of the financial end of it and stuff. So, and he just took care of the household and. When the kids started coming along, he took care of the children. And uh, I did never want to go to work. One thing I said, I don't want to work while we have children. And that's, I want to raise the children for us, not, for some, not let somebody else raise them. And even though we might not have much, we won't, you know, I wouldn't go to work. And he said, no, I don't want you to work. And uh, so we did all right that way. We didn't have much, but we made it. I babysat sometimes. I did little things to fix up the place and, you know, we, we, the vaults were kind of crooked and stuff and I wanted to paper fresh and I papered some of the rooms and and uh, fixed up so and, no, I think for the most part we, we didn't, we might have not always agreed 100%, but we never argued, never fought. There was no fights going on. I didn't, couldn't stand that. When I heard people fighting, that was awful. I didn't like that, you know. So I did a lot of praying too, because uh, when I was expecting our oldest child, God spoke to me really. And I said, I'm sorry, Lord, I got away from you. I know I shouldn't have uh, been away from you, but I came back to the Lord and and God helped me on through it, through every bit, you know, if there was anything. I mean, he, was, he got very busy, and uh, but always make sure you have time somewhere make sure you have time always for each other it's very very important and uh, he got so involved in work that he didn't have a lot of time for the children and that was hard that was a little hard but 
I played ball with the kids. I went to the ball field. It wasn't too far away. Man, I got so many blue spots from the ball hitting me back. I would <laughs> pitch the ball to the kids. And I'd, I was afraid we'd break windows if it was in a street playing because they weren't. You know, I said, let's go to the ball field there. And they were good. They could hit. Oh, yeah. They could hit pretty good. So then they got involved in ball games. Dad had one team, the men's team. And two of the boys were on one team and one was another team. So who are you going to watch tonight, Mom? I'm going to take turns. I go here for a while. I go there for a while. I go there for a while. I said, that's the way, that's the way I did it. We went camping. We did have a good time. He took us to Le Moyne for a week. He had come to town every day and work. And we had a ball. We did a little bit of fishing. I got kids something to Le Moyne. We loved it there in the park. And one, there. one time we moved. And, and we had a tent then. And we moved the tent, and Grandpa couldn't find us. <laughs> well, it was an elderly man. He said afterwards, said, I bet you we were camping right there. I said, you were there. I think I bet they were there all the time. The Morris family, you know, uh, they uh, they loved your dog. Uh, they just loved that uh, uh, golden. Brandy. Oh, yeah, they loved Brandy. And she took right to them when she was there. She just took right to them. And she would write to him every time when they were there. And then if he was there, oh, he just loved that dog. And, and Brandy knew it. She would write to him. And anyway, so, and she said, I know we were camping there. I said, I, I remember, but I'm not sure who it was, but I know. She said, we were there every week. And I know you must have been there. And then another man came by and they said, lady, do you need some help? And I said, well, we like to found a different spot and we, we could take it if we can get there. So we would brag in it and he said, I'll help you. So we pulled up stakes and he helped me. We took the tent over to another place. And Grandpa couldn't find it? Well, for a minute he said, where have they gone <laughs> when he come home from work? That was kind of funny. But we had so much fun all the time. We played games all the time and went hiking all the time. Went through the, there was a trail through the woods way around and we walked the trail. It was so safe those days. You could just do anything. And then the kids went on and tried to do fishing. Had a little, they come and get a hot dog and cut it in pieces and try to get crabs and stuff. They did a little bit of fishing like that. They just had a lot of fun. Was it like raising three boys? Uh, Difficult? I got you. No, no, I don't think it was that bad. No, my neighbor said, you're, you're so fortunate. She had three girls. She said, I'd take one boy. And then she had a boy finally. She said, what a much easier to raise boys than okay. girls. She said, yeah. She had two two girls and, and and a boy, and she said, "I can't believe how." I'm like, "No, she had four girls. That's right, three girls. I mean, and a boy. The last was a boy, and uh, she just she just found the boy so much easier." And I said, "Well, I wouldn't know." <laughs> so, but no, the boys were good. Yeah, we had we had a good time. Yeah, they were all pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Then I mean, we always went to church. Always. Had our Bible reading every day, and we got started with that, and I got them into it, all of them. And even the little neighbor boy would come over, and when we had our prayer, our babysitter's uh, uh, little boy came over, and we um, were praying, and he come over. So when I was praying, he come over, stared on me. Don't forget, don't forget, Mama. Don't forget, uh, uh, Grandma. And don't. I had to pray for all of them. I made it simple so he would little understand, you know. But anyway, his brother got saved <laughs> later on. And uh, I just loved that girl, the babysitter there. And uh, she was just like a daughter to me. I didn't have one. She was 14 when she come to get take, take your father out. Man, did she love that little boy. She went to, she said, can I take him and go have his picture taken? I said, sure. She went and had a big picture of your dad right by her bed. She just loved that little boy. And see if she was 14. And the kids came around looking for, for children they could take out walking. And they lived like slant across the street from us. And she did that for quite a while. What was, what was Anthony like as a little boy? Oh, he was an awful good child. He was so happy all the time. Yeah. He was always jolly, always laughing, <laughs> always happy. He got serious all of a sudden. When he got older, he got everything was foolishness. I couldn't believe it. I said, if you knew yourself when you were little, you laughed all your time happy. Smiling, and the photographer. When I was going to take his picture, like Grants would have pictures. You could come 
a picture is taken for a dollar, one picture, you know, something. And I go in and he's, I can't wait to get to him. He is such a, uh, you know, loves to have his picture taken, smiles already when he's not even in line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. And uh, she just, she had a beautiful picture of him. She took him, I let her take him to Grants and have a picture so she could have one with him. And uh, his, her grandmother, oh my goodness, she was French. She just, she said, Gail, go get me Anthony. Go get me Tony. She said, go get me Tony. I got to see my boy. And she just had to go over there and, and see him. And of course, Mme was her. And when she was, I went shopping one time on a sidewalk sale they used to have. I went to shop and, and, and uh, this lady come around and, you know, and she said, you probably think, who's this foolish old lady? And I said, no, I don't think that way. And he just reached out to her and then she, oh, my boy, how are you? And she, he was in the car, you know, sitting in, his, in the wheel, happy, smiling to everything, you know, and she just loved him. What about Paul? Paul was a very good kid, too. He was a good boy. He was not a, um, how shall I say it? Well, the middle child, you have the first one, they want all the attention and, and, and because they're used to it. Yeah. Then comes the second one, and he, he still wants the attention. He has to be good. The third one comes, Paul still has to be a good boy because I was busy with the third one. So Paul was always, uh, I almost felt a little bad. Katie Thomas lived with us, and she says, I'm the middle child. I know what it's like, Paul. <laughs> she took to Paul a lot. But Paul was never gave me any trouble at all. Really, he didn't. And uh, whenever, when he got older, a young teen, and I asked him to help me. He said, Mama, you always ask me, I said, because you don't give me any trouble. And, uh, you know, sometimes the boys give me hard trouble. So he was, he was good, you know. So I didn't have any problem with Paul, really. I can't say. He went to church with us. Even when he was way grown up, he always went to church. When I went camping, uh, camp, I mean, when I was working for camp, for the teen camp, 150 kids, I was cooking for them there. And he said, Mama, can I go with you? And I said, sure, if you don't have anything to do, I'd love to go and help you. So I went a week with the older scenes, and then I went with the 140 for the younger group. My goodness, we had so many kids, but I loved it. I almost killed myself working. But you know what? I had the energy then. I could do it. Yeah. And it was, it was fun. It was fun. And what about Ralph? Yeah, he was all right, too. He, uh, he was all right. A little bit of a, <laughs> well, I don't want to be too harsh on him. Of course, yeah. he being the first one was a little spoiled by all of us. Grandma, oh, grandma yeah. spoiled him a lot. Oh, yeah, she spoiled him a lot. And uh, she spoiled, spoiled all of the boys, really, but uh, she was good. But he just adored his grandmother. So she was. he was cut very close to his grandmother. She was the first one that we had in the first, uh, they didn't know if he even could have children because he had uh, sick, when he was sick, when he was 18, they didn't think he might be able to have children. I didn't know that, but hey, we had no problem. <laughs> we want the children right off. We had them right off, so yeah. we were anxious to have a family. And uh, I would advise anybody wait two years, have more time to get to know each other. And you need to, you need to get a lot uh, closer to each other as far as for a couple and wait with the children a little bit. Give yourself time and get close to each other. And it, it just, it's, it's better. We didn't have enough time to really, although it was okay, things went all right. They're not, I can't say that they're bad. You know, we had a good, we had, a, he had a lot of, uh, he did take a lot of his job very serious. And sometimes there was not time for the children, and that was kind of hard. On the, he didn't realize how hard it was on the children. But, you know, when the kids tell you, oh, they wish their daddy would have more time. But um, I don't know. I don't want to say anything because it was okay. It was okay. So, yeah, we worked it out. Seems like it's all worked out pretty well. Oh yeah, it's worked out good. They're all doing good. They're all love their dad, and I'm glad they do. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's fine. Sixty years and whatever else God gives us, we'll take it. Yeah. So, I think uh, 
You're known as a prayer warrior, though. Has that helped? I am a prayer warrior, I guess, very much. That drove me to the Lord like you wouldn't believe. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Why? The kids were well, just, I just felt close to God. And uh, whenever I felt a little stressed, I'd talk to God. And I mean, in the morning before the kids went, I was more involved in church than dad was for a while. So he wasn't uh, quite as, as involved uh, at first, but he came too. So, no, I, uh, when the kids went to school, before they left, I would always be in a bedroom on my knees praying while they ate their breakfast. Paul would sneak in. He was the soft kid. He would sneak in and get on his knees right next to me and kiss me goodbye and gently and it wouldn't disturb me though. He knew I was praying. And then, uh, then he'd take off and close the door again. So I thought it was always so sweet of him. And oh, no, things worked out. I think we did pretty good, really, as family. We've had a pretty good life. And You've been uh, doing your daily devotions together. How long have you been doing those together? When he was ready to do it, and we did it, I asked a few times. Nope, he said, first he said, no, that's a personal thing, he said. And I said, but we're supposed to be one. And so I said, okay, I said to myself, I won't push, Lord, give, give me, help me not to push it. And I learned not to push. But, uh, oh yeah, he's doing good now. How do you think it's helped your marriage? Oh my goodness. I tell you, Christian life helps marriage. Oh, it's a big, big deal. How so? It's just that you're close to God and you know, um, you just hold each other up in prayer. And even my prayers, I will say, don't. Don't let my husband get discouraged and we can't, we can't let it, can't let Satan keep us down. No way, no matter, no matter what, we, yes, we are hurting. But I said, Jesus is with us and God is our stay and our God is our strength. And we need to show. And even, even the boss has said, you guys, you really are Christians. And uh, I want God to, uh, want him to know that. The guys, of course, I said, I, I just, uh, they are having something going on. We can't go to it. I just can't walk that far. We can't walk that far. It's on the other end of the lake. They're having something. Mon Monday, they're having a cookout at 3 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They want, they're going to have all kinds of stuff there, but they want us to bring uh, side dishes and dessert. I can't go over there, so I can't. To it the people that would take us are gone yeah. so and it's okay i don't mind i don't mind it just just stay here it's okay you do devotions morning and evening oh yeah you how do. long does it take how long do you pray in the morning it's at least an hour yeah at least an hour i know i need to cut it shorter but i said how do you cut it off who do you cut out you know and at night as we do two at night he does a little shorter he starts it at night time. No, he does in the morning. He does just a few minutes. And then he lets me do the prayer time. And then we both read the Bible and both had a booklet that we read. Then at night we don't read anything, but we just have the prayer. And uh, of course, uh, sometimes one of them falls asleep a little bit, but we wake up again. <laughs> God knows. <laughs> how long, how much time do you spend in prayer a day, do you think? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's more than that. But when you're older, you can do that easier than when you're younger. It's hard, and that's why, that's why I get up at uh, early, because I don't want no phone calls. And by 7 o'clock, our devotion, our shower, our bed's made, everything is ready. We get ready for breakfast. And then we play a little game. Triple Yahtzee. How many games of Yahtzee have you played in your life? Oh my goodness, I don't know. 10,000? I have no, well, you figure almost. We don't play Sunday, so you won't play on Sunday. I said, that's okay. Yeah. But we do most, uh, if I get really busy, I will say, well, maybe we have time later, I'll play one. But uh, right now I'm really busy, you know, so. He said, okay, but other than that, we've been doing pretty good. He was ahead of me for a long time. I got ahead of him a little bit now. You could play three games a day? Usually. How many years have you been doing that? Since we've been here anyway. We didn't do it before so much. Of course, when we worked, we didn't play. We didn't have time. But uh, But you did in Bangor too, right? Oh, yeah, we did in Bangor. Too. 
but not much while we work and we didn't we played with people a lot we had yeah. games with people he went to mrs moore after her husband died and we played uh, her and i played yahtzee all the time then it was three of us so we sometimes you don't play head and foot with three people well, so three games a day you know <laughs> 300 days a year yeah so that's probably. almost a thousand games a year <laughs> Yeah, we played a lot. Yeah, you're probably over 10,000. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> it's good to try to keep our brain going, but I don't know if it, my brain wants to get kind of messed up sometimes. It doesn't. No, but I love my grandchildren. I pray for all of them every single day, yeah. morning and night, both. I'm anxious for Morgan to come and spend the weekend, too. Yeah. I said, I want you the whole weekend. She says, I'm going to come Friday after work. I don't want to just come Saturday and go home the next day. I want to stay. And I said, good. Go to church with me, and and I'll, I'll, I'll just be happy to have you come to church for once, just to see, you know, to get to know this pastor. Well, she likes all that music like that, that yeah. happy music and stuff. And uh, we don't have a lot of young people right now. There's some, but not very many. But he's, try he's working hard on it. The new Spanish people are starting to come in. But well, we got two Spanish ministers there. Yeah. yeah. They're doing the WANA program and stuff, and it's been good. So, yeah. There's one thing you want the boys to remember. What would it be? How much I love them. Yeah. My life is just around the kids. Everything was important around the kids. Yeah. And all that, what I want them to know, to stay close to Jesus so we all meet up there. I don't want nobody left behind. And from grandchildren or anybody. So, no, that's, and I want them to be happy in their marriage too, in their life. Strive for peace. And really pray together, pray together, pray together. It's so important to take your children to church. And I mean, my kids from cradle on, they've been in church. And Abby and Andrew have too. They were with us. I mean, I took care of them all the time, send Sundays, most almost every Sunday, because Auntie Paula had to work every Sunday for a long time. And we loved to help out. We wanted to help the kids as much as we could, because you guys weren't that close, so we couldn't really. I know, we were a couple hours you, away. You were a couple hours away. It was harder. And Auntie Marge said afterwards, I don't know what's wrong with me, why I didn't take them over there. They could have had it. Of course, I said, we, they were just as welcome as, as the other ones. And it was very important to me. And I mean, they had me pray. I prayed with the kids every night when they were there the nights. And they spent every week some nights with us. And especially Saturday night and Sunday and so. And Abby and Andrew, they both wanted me to be by their bedside to pray with them both. And I did all the time. I mean, it was so funny. I used to just see an Andrew. I mean, he couldn't talk, but he was laughing all the time. He was a happy kid. He was at the table and he wanted to eat. He's just hungry. And I said, okay, first we say amen. So he put his little hands together. Amen, he goes. <laughs> that was so cute. And he had to wait. And I said, uh, not eaten yet. So <laughs> and he was just so funny. And I had to, I, took, I went and got him. And then the Ralph would come pick him up. I was in the kitchen cooking, you know. And he stood there looking at me and looking at me. And he says, amen, amen. Would you give me something now? I tell you, it was adorable. Oh, it was just so adorable, you know? And I would take some peas out and blow them, make sure they were cool enough, you know? And he just stood there, and he so seriously said, he said his prayer, you know? He couldn't even talk. I mean, that's all he could say. I would eat bananas all the time with peanut butter on it. Well, those kids wanted the bananas with peanut butter on it, so they started eating. So I have some pictures somewhere with all three of us sitting there holding a banana and I slapped the peanut butter on and they were eating peanut butter and, and banana. So, oh my goodness, we had some fun times. One time grandpa was sleeping in a chair and Abby was uh, around playing with her toys, you know. You know how our porch was around the corner and there was all the toys on that other end. And Andrew had really walked yet. He was little. I was sitting on the couch and just watching him. He was sitting there watching him. Grandpa was snoring, and Andrew looked at me, grinning. All of a sudden, he pushed himself up at all four. He looked at me and started laughing, and off he went walking around the corner. It was so funny. 
<laughs> he said, Grandma, I almost remember the day. He said, I know from that time I've walked at night. And he's, I said, you sure did. <laughs> and we had some awful good times with the kids, really. All of them, really. And that's good memories. Well, Grandma, I think we've been going for over an hour. So. Oh, it's time. <laughs> well, I mean. You may have to edit it a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. And, you know. I don't want any hard feelings anyway. Oh, yeah, but... don't worry about that. But no, thank you. I've been very happy with my family. I'm so glad your family's been close to the Lord all the time, most of the time that I know of. And it's been good to see you guys grow and your kids have grown in and, and the Lord. And that's now getting married ourselves. I know, that's something. And I know, uh, you know, Morgan, I know she's having a little hard time, but uh, she's anxious too. And she's hoping that her love is strong for him as it was before. She's just hoping about that will be good. Yeah. I hope it does go good. And, you know, he seems like an awful nice guy. I, I said, I don't think you can find any better than that. And I was, as long as you feel good about it. And I said, I pray for you every single night, for you guys and for you too. And I said, Emily and and, and uh, uh, Michael doing good. And uh, I hope you do well too. And he said, I hope so. Michael looking forward to it now. She said, now I'm getting psyched up about it. So she's got all kinds of furniture ready to. Yeah, I know. No kidding. It's funny. She's, she said, I don't have to buy anything. And she don't mind using her secondhand stuff. She loves that leather couch. That is comfortable, really. It is. It is. <laughs> so totally, yeah. She said, I got my bed, I got my bureau, I got a couple of chairs. I got all we need, really. She said, you know, as far as that goes, I gave her a couple of little things. For, yeah. almost said, put it in your hope chest for later on. <laughs> I had a nice piece of set. I mean, there's stainless steel, some of them were. But it's a nice set, you know. And I said, might not be the most fanciest, but I sent away for it one time and kept it always for past. And didn't use it that much. Very seldom did I use it. And there's a lot of stuff in there for 12, service for 12. So I said, look at you started until if you want something better. It has the case um, nicely in it and everything, so it makes it nice. A couple other little things. And so I hope she does good. So I hope things go good. I'm anxious to see. I hope. I think he's crazy about her. I really do. <laughs> I think he is. I I know. Oh, yeah. And uh, I said, don't you uh, hurt his feelings now. You be good to him. I said, don't. Don't be mean to him, I said. Because I feel like he's my already my grandson-in-law. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you for doing this, Grandma. Okay, you're welcome. It's better when we're alone now to have everybody in there. Yeah. This, I, I didn't interfere with you guys when you were with that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Stop.